Okay, Einstein said everything is relative. Everything we measure depends upon who's doing the measuring. Time is one of those things. So this lesson is about uh, connecting time as measured by two observers in two different reference frames. It's called the time dilation formula. And to look at time measurement, we need to bring up this construct called a light clock. And this is what Einstein used to uh, establish this relationship of time. So a light clock, imagine a rectangle. Uh, and inside this rectangle, we've got a mirror at the bottom, and we've got a mirror at the top. And we have uh, a photon that travels up, is reflected off the mirror at the top, and comes back down to the bottom again. Um, when we talk about an interval of time, we need sort of uh, a starting and an ending point for that interval of time. We call them typically event number one and event number two. So in this case, a complete tick tock of this light clock is represented by two events. Event one, photon is emitted from the bottom of the light clock, travels all the way up, bounces off the top, comes back down to the bottom, and event number two, photon hits the bottom mirror face again. Okay, so according to um, this individual holding this light clock, he would see the two events, event one, event two, happening at the same location, the bottom of the light clock. Uh, and somebody who does occur, or who does observe, two events that delimit uh, a time interval, if he sees those two events happening at the same location, he will observe what's called proper time. Proper time. Okay, so those are two important ideas. Proper time uh, and events define a time interval. Okay, to have a look at our are different times of are observed by two different uh, observers. We're going to look at the following scenario. So here we have two astronauts in spacecrafts, and that gives them fairly large relative speeds. Uh, astronaut A is in spaceship A at rest. Astronaut B is traveling in spaceship B uh, at 0.95 times the speed of light, so very fast. Um, both astronauts have light, cr light clocks on their crafts, identical light clocks. And the question here is, find the time that astronaut A observes for the event, and we'll call the uh, the event here, so an event, an interval of time is defined by two events. Uh, so we'll call it one tick of astronaut B's uh, clock. Okay, uh, we need to define uh, a few variables here. Uh, again, the event is one. Uh, Okay, sorry, we'll, we'll change that. One tick tock of the light clock, so that's one complete return of the photon is, is the event we're interested in. Clearly, the beginning of the event uh, would be the emission from the bottom of the light clock, and the end of the event would be the return of the photon. Okay, T naught is the proper time, and of course that's going to be uh, measured by the observer who sees the start and starting point and ending point of the event happening at the same location. Uh, T is the time interval is measured by any other observer in any other inertial reference frame. L is the length of the light clock, and V, in this case, is 0.95 C. It is the relative speed of the, the two reference frames, or the two observers, in this case, astronaut A and astronaut uh, B. So here's our scenario again, and the question is, find the time that astronaut A observes for the event one tick of astronaut B's light clock. Okay, and we just have to find those variables. Okay, so here's what we have. Um, in the time it takes B, uh, the spaceship, to get from here to here. So the spaceship actually travels a certain distance in that uh, one tick of the uh, time clock. Um, now, astronaut A is going to observe that photon actually traveling sort of along this path up here and then back down here again. And I've shown it in the diagram up top. Uh, this distance would be a distance s. Um, for symmetry, it's going to be easier if we just look at half of that round trip. So not the tick-tock, but just the tick part. So the 
photon has actually traveled just to the top of the light clock. Um, by symmetry, we know that the full round trip will be just be twice that time. Um, but you'll see in a second how, how it's a lot easier to follow uh, using that simplification. Okay, so observer A is going to see the photon travel a distance s. Uh, astronaut B, or observer B, is actually going to see the photon travel just the distance L. According to the astronaut B, the, the photon only travels straight up, hits the top, and and that's uh, that's dictates the time interval. And again, according to observer A, the spaceship will have moved a distance V, the point nine five C, times uh, the time that A observes happens, so that it will that distance will be v times t. Okay, so you can see we've got a uh, a useful little right angle triangle uh, right here, and so we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find out or to describe a relationship between the hypotenuse and the two sides. Okay, so nothing nothing crazy yet, but that's the relationship between those variables. And, and we're looking for a relationship between t and t naught. So proper time and any other time is represented by any other inertial reference frame. Um, it's not clear how to get there yet, but I think if we look at this idea, Einstein's postulate, that the speed of light should be the same for all inertial observers, uh, we can look at the speed of light as measured by astronaut A. And of course, he's going to see that photon travel a, a distance s. According to his time, it would be a non-proper time, t. Okay, so there you have the speed of light according to observer A. Uh, now, observer B is going to see something a little different. He's going to see uh, the photon just travel straight up in the light clock, the, the length of the light clock. It'll go that distance, and of course, his time will be proper time. Again, we made that simplification that we're only going uh, a tick, not a full tick tock, but um, he is in fact observing half of the proper time interval by, by that one tick, so, so that indeed is true. Um, there you have two speeds of light in terms of uh, the other variables, and we can now use, we'll call this equation 2 and equation 3. And we can substitute equations 2 and 3 into 1 um, to get a little closer to where we want to be. And that is t and t naught, an expression for those two. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, equation number 2 and sub it into equation number 1. So it looks like s equals, from equation 2, s equals c times t. So s squared will be c squared times t squared. Follow me on that? And I can leave this term alone, it already has time in there, but the third term in this expression, I need to get rid of L. And from equation 3, L is C times T naught, so L squared is C squared times T naught squared. So now I've got an expression T in terms of T naught, and that's going to be something that I can use, and we'll just pause there for a sec. Okay, that's really all the physics and a little bit of algebra. And <clears throat> okay, if I factor out my uh, my t squareds here and, and bring this term to the other side, I get uh, c squared t squared minus v squared t squared equals c squared t naught squared. Factor out my, my t squares. Okay, and if I divide both sides by c squared here, I get this. c squared into the bracket here, and I get let's divide this up and dividing
multiplying both sides by this term, I get, again, I'm trying to separate my t squareds and t naught squareds. So I get t squared equals 1 over that term. And of course, c squared over c squared is just 1. And I'm going to call that v over c all squared. Same thing as v squared over c squared. t naught squared here. OK. Uh, take the square root of both sides. And now I've got an expression for t in terms of t naught. Oops. Or all squared. Okay, and I can also write this like so. Of course, the square root of 1 in the numerator is just 1. That is the time dilation formula. And this term here, which looks a little ugly, is called the Lorentz factor. And it's given the Greek letter gamma. Um, oh, great. Okay, we're back again. It's called the Lorentz factor. Uh, comes up a lot in special relativity problems, and it depends upon the relative speed v of your reference frames. So as v approaches a large number, so as this gets bigger and bigger, um, then this term will approach one. So as v approaches c, um, that term approaches one, and uh, your Lorentz factor gets very large. In fact, I think if you analyze this, you'll notice your Lorentz factor has to be uh, greater than or equal to one. It can never be less than one. Talk about speeds here. Okay, so let's uh, let's write that down one more time. Time dilation formula looks something like this. Um, and the Lorentz factor can be found by substituting in your value for relative speed v. Okay, and of course, your Lorentz factor must be greater than or equal to one. Okay, so let's have a look back at our, our original situation. We're looking at the two astronauts. Um, their relative speeds were 0.95c. Uh, th the question was, find the time that astronaut A observes for the event one tick of astronaut B's clock. Um, let's put some numbers to this. And let's say that, uh, according to astronaut B, one second has gone past, or one second has passed by. And um, what does A observe? OK. So for astronaut B, I think you will agree that he is going to observe proper time. So in this case, if astronaut B observes one second pass by on his light clock, uh, that in fact is proper time. Why? Because the photon uh, comes off the bottom of the light clock and returns to the bottom according to observer or astronaut B at the same location in his hand. Astronaut A actually sees that occurring at two different locations separated by a distance of uh, VT. And so his time is going to be quite different. And so astronaut A's time in the time dilation formula will be that non-proper time. And so astronaut A is going to his time is going to be dilated by that factor, the Lorentz factor. And of course, this is just uh, one second we agreed upon. So in this case, it's just a question of working out um, what that what that Lorentz factor is. And in this particular example, it is 1 minus 
0.95c over c, and of course that's all squared. And I think when you do the math here, you get 3.2 is the Lorentz factor. No units for the Lorentz factor, but of course there would be units for time, one second, so 3.2 times one, and observer A is going to observe that 3.2 seconds has actually passed. Time has been dilated. Not a big deal when you're talking about seconds, but when you're talking about years or decades or centuries, um, when one of the reference frames is moving, it makes a big difference. So just to recap, we can use the time dilation formula. And here it is right here. We can use that formula when our problem, one of our reference frames, the time interval is proper time. Otherwise, not very useful. Can't use it.